in this old wider world Oh, left in this world alone I have no hope for tomorrow But I heard of a city, Lord, called heaven. And I'm trying to make heaven, Lord, my home. Sometimes I am so, so, so. So tired, Lord. Sometimes I am my own child. I don't know which way I can roll. Oh, yes, I can roll. But I heard of a city long called heaven, and I'm striving to make a heaven Lord Our opening prayer today will be short. It is something I wrote a little while ago for a project at seminary. It is the following haiku. Jesus gathered his friends, died for all of his friends, lives eternally with us. Amen. Our opening hymn was written by Yasushige Imakoma in 1965, while Japan was still rebuilding after World War II. Imakoma was quite concerned with the state of war in the world, and he believed that creating authentic communication between warring people was necessary to end war, but he knew through reading the Bible and his studies, that that kind of communication, that kind of authentic communication, was only born through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So he wrote this song, Send Your Word.
Shalom, peace. All right, so the Bible verse that I'm going to talk about today is from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Shalom, peace. All right. Now that you know peace in two different languages, I'd like to teach you what peace looks like in American Sign Language. Are you guys ready? All right, watch closely, because you guys are gonna have to do it in a minute, all right? First, you're gonna put one hand on top of the other hand, clasped together like this. Next, switch your hands around, okay? Then, you're gonna push both hands down and away from you. Okay, do we think we can do that together? That's the sign for peace. All right, let's do the whole sign together. Ready? That's great, good job. All right, this sign really reminds me of what God tells us about peace in Philippians 4, through, 6 through 7. When I start the sign for peace, it feels like I'm worried. I'm wringing my hands, right? They're not settled down, are they? But God says, don't be anxious about anything. He doesn't want us to worry about things in our families or school or in the world. And that's when you hold your hands still together, right? At the very, very middle. God tells us to pray to him and let him know what's bothering us. Then he can give us peace. This final part of the sign is like God smoothing out and taking away all of our worries. We won't even be able to understand it, but he will protect us from being afraid, from being worried, and he will calm us down. So the next time you're worried or afraid, what are you going to do? Pray and ask God to help you, and he will calm you down and give you a beautiful feeling of peace. All right, now let's fold our hands and pray. You guys ready? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us peace when we are afraid. Help us to have shalom all the time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now for our prayers and praises. Praise the Lord for the opportunity to worship together and his protection over our church family. We pray for Bob Reed, who is scheduled for heart bypass surgery on November 30th. We continue to pray for the family of Bill Latham as they grieve his loss. Judy Rothman, Jean Lurch's sister, who is recovering from a stroke. Nathan Rowland's mother, who is recovering at home from internal bleeding, will be seeing a liver specialist, so keep her in prayers for that. Melba Abrams, who is recovering at rehab from surgery. Walter Albert, Debbie Michelle's father, who is also recovering in rehab. Cindy Latham's mother, Ruth Wiggins, who is in the hospital recovering from a stroke. All right, let's pray. Father God, we lift these praises and prayers up to you and express our faith in you the way our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture for today is Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 17. Later he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. The word of God from the people of God. When you join a United Methodist congregation, you stand in the front of the church and take a vow to be faithful through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and witness. What does witness even mean? To give witness means to tell us, your brothers and sisters in Christ, when the Holy Spirit does something in your life. In the wider church, we call this giving your testimony. Pastor Sung asked me to give my testimony this morning, one that would explain why I, as a member of this church, must travel halfway around the world to do it proud. First, I need to lay the foundation for my testimony, give you some background information I grew up in the roughest neighborhood in the nation at the time, the Hunting Park neighborhood of North Philadelphia, nicknamed Murder Town. Due to its significant contribution to the over 300 deaths a year caused by gun violence in the city, I'm going to refrain from telling you about how it got so bad, the Mafia, the Crooked Police Department, the mayors, and the FBI. If you really want to know about all of that, you can Google it. All you need to know is that I survived that neighborhood because of my grandmother, the prayerful woman who raised me. Besides her home, the only other place I found solace was seated crisscross applesauce upon the carpet of my elementary school's library with my back leaning up against the magazine racks. I always had an issue of National Geographic magazine opened upon my lap. I remember flipping through those pages, immersed in the articles and the photographs. Lord have mercy, the photographs. I wanted to go to each and every place shown in those magazines, even though I knew in my heart that no soul from my neighborhood had gone anywhere. I'm not kidding. As an adult, I visit my mom back in the old neighborhood. A childhood friend, Danny, did the same from his new home of Minnesota. I get the update, the tally on where our eighth grade class, the guys were. I'd ask Danny, I'd say, hey Danny, how many are in jail, dead, or priests? At first, the jail number went up. Then the dead number went up, taking over the highest spot. I am the fourth person to head toward ordination of some kind. Danny was the only one to stay out of all three categories. There was one thing about those National Geographic magazines that I never told anyone until recently. There was one place in this world that was reported on repeatedly in so many issues, their military history, their geography, the arts and culture, 
every time I saw articles and pictures of this one place, I got goosebumps. I felt a, a pull. It was Japan. As I neared my high school graduation, I still wanted to see the world. Everyone nudged me towards a career in the arts for obvious reasons. But I wanted to become a pilot. That way seeing the world would become my job. I only applied to Embry-Riddle University in Florida and I got accepted to two colleges. Yes, you heard me right. I applied to one college and got accepted to two. The second was Tikyo University in Tokyo, Japan. Their acceptance letter also told me how I had a full scholarship. Around the same time, I was called towards ordination. During my Catholic high school religious retreat, God gave me a vision of myself hanging out with ordained people and artists at the same time. That is the foundation of my testimony. Me as a young man with a golden opportunity to see the world and a calling to do God's work. Unable to make heads or tails of that crazy vision and too scared to leave my pathetic neighborhood. I did not go to Tokyo and I ran from my call for two decades. Regardless, the spirit continued to pull me towards ordination and Japan. My actual testimony begins with an act of violence. I got married in my mid-twenties. We began raising our first child in South Philadelphia, far from murder town, but not far enough. On a sunshine-filled Sunday morning in 2007, I sat on the couch playing with our toddler. We heard praise music lilt in through the open window from the church across the street. Then a drug deal went bad on the far corner. Drugs were given, money was not given in return. Tires squealed, gunshots rang out, bullets followed the target poorly, pierced side of parked cars across the street. Cars belonging to old black ladies who were singing the Lord's praises at the moment. A minute later, I watched the old ladies survey the damage from my step. Had the song ended a little sooner. I know there were other reasons why we moved out of Philadelphia entirely, but none of them, none of them haunted me like this one. What if my kid and I were outside that morning? I've never been able to shake a feeling of obligation to do something for the kinds of neighborhoods I grew up in. On the slide that you're looking at, the yellow cross is where my home was at the time. The white arrow shows the bullet's trajectory. Don't be surprised when I tell you the spirit kept pulling me to Japan. I went to the bookstore where I once worked and a book called The Code of the Samurai by Tahir Shigesuke practically jumped off the shelves at me. It was about Bushido with the moral code of the warriors of historical Japan, the samurai. One of its pages read, in any case, when you forget death and become inattentive, you may say something offensive to someone and get into an argument Stroll about in resorts where you have no business, bump into some oath, and get into an unexpected brawl. You could lose your own life. I was coming to terms with abandoning my hometown that lost a young person of color daily and thought, was Tahira writing this to the young people of his day or mine? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit echoed 
to hear his word in the back of my mind for 13 of the 20 years I spent running from God. After I had hit rock bottom and finally answered my call in 2019, I soon entered Wesley Theological Seminary where one of my professors assigned a project. Make a video explaining where you see yourself being the most useful as a pastor. I chose Wilmington, Delaware as my location because by 2019 it had inherited the name Murder Town. I got goosebumps as I realized I was being called to minister to the hoods like mine. Yes, this article on Wilmington is from Australia. This was global news. I worked in Wilmington itself for eight years. On September 1st, 2021, our district superintendent, Dr. Calvert, gathered us fledgling deacons and pastors on a Zoom call. We were informed about our next hurdles, including the words, if you feel called to make your own ministry, that paperwork is due soon. I got goosebumps like I did when I was a child. In my mind, I heard the words from the code of the samurai echoing again. I said to myself, why not? Let's try it. Let's look it up. I googled United Methodist Church Samurai. I immediately found a book called Bushido and Christianity, written by a United Methodist pastor, the Reverend Takemi Sasamori. The late Reverend. I bought the book. I read how the United States forced Japan to open up to the world in the 1800s and how Christianity was legal, but missionaries still risked their lives to spread the gospel in Japan. One missionary was the Methodist James Bauer, who was distinguished from the Catholic missionaries because he didn't walk with the armed guards like they did. The samurai were a little offended by him, and when they questioned him, he replied, I believe that in Japan, a nation which, is, which values Bushido, there are no cowards who would attack an unarmed foreigner. The Japanese felt this foreigner understood them. Fifteen samurai joined his English class. They were ordered to spy on him by their leaders. Instead, they became Christians. Some became church fathers themselves. The Kemi Sasamori defined Bushido as compassion for one's opponent. These warriors spent their lives learning how to defeat their enemies while causing them the least amount of suffering. This focus on compassion impacted every other facet of their samurai lives. Sasamori introduced me to another writer, Uchimura Kanso, who used the word that gardeners would understand to explain that Christianity grafted upon Bushido will be the finest product of the world. To graft means to attach or merge parts of two different plants together. When I read these words, I finally knew what my message was. As an artist, I knew I still had a big hill to climb. As an artist, I knew it was one thing to have a message. It was an entirely different thing to find the right artistic medium for the message. Our Bible passage for today comes from the Gospel according to Mark and depicts a conversation between the risen Lord and his disciples, whom he commissioned to proclaim the Gospel. He described those who believe in him as those who could cast out demons and speak in new tongues. We Christians 2,000 plus years removed from the time of Christ do not have to worry about casting on demons as much as the earlier church did. 
It can be said that evil at the time of Christ tried to balance out his extreme goodness with an overwhelming presence. What in the world are new tongues, though? What does that even mean? When the word tongue is used in this way, it refers to the ways people communicate. During Jesus' lifetime, the main way people communicated was through speech. Few people wrote things. It was an expensive practice. This period of time is called the primary orality by historians. Primary orality. Lasting from the beginning of humanity until the creation of the printing press. Then the period of time dominated by books called the Gutenberg Parenthesis started. Gutenberg Parenthesis. It lasted only 500 years and it is over. We now live in the secondary orality. Secondary orality. And we communicate in real time across the globe through text, speech, and video. Doesn't it make sense? Since the way our entire world communicates has changed, that new tongues would be born. How do we identify a new tongue when we see it? There is an old saying that goes, where there's smoke, there's fire. The smoke that you look for when trying to find a new tongue is a new culture. There is a new culture. Estimates say that between 40 and 60% of our global population make up this culture. Let that sink in. About 50% of everyone. Not any 50%. How about most of our young people? Look around you. When you're in this sense work, when you travel, look around you. Do you think we should translate the gospel to a culture made up of our young people? The new tongue at the center of this new culture is anime. Also known as Japanese animation. It became a global phenomenon the same year I got my letter from Tokyo and had my vision. It became so huge when Pokemon first aired globally in 1997. Just prior to me answering my call in the fall of 2020, the anime movie called Demon Slayer, Mugen Train, hit theaters the world over. It grossed $506 million, becoming the first highest grossing film to come from outside of Hollywood. This at a time when no one wanted to go to theaters. Thinking back to our Bible passage for today, does anyone else find it ironic that the biggest movie during the darkest times any of us have experienced is a movie about a young man working to exercise demons for the people he loves? Anyone else find that ironic? Anybody? Knowing my message was the blending of Christianity and Bushido. Knowing my medium was anime, I contacted Dr. Calvert, our district superintendent, and we had a chat. I told her my goal was to make an anime about the conversion of the Christian samurai centered on their understanding of compassion and then spin off a church from those who felt moved by the film. We have been working to make my calling a reality ever since. I drew this slide myself, by the way, as a sketch of what is to come. This opportunity gave me an immediate headache. 
At the time, I was working a full-time job at a public school, part-time here, and going to seminary, plus two kids. I contacted my advisor, along with the dean of Wesley Theological Seminary, and shared my idea of a church in anime culture with them. Now my final project or capstone is this anime church. The spirit has tied together every facet of my life into this singular calling that my friends have made me more nervous about. They scoffed at me for focusing upon impacting just the hoods like mine. My friend Frida, who lives outside of Tokyo, comes from Kenya. She said all her nieces and nephews do back home in Kenya is watch anime. My friend Laura currently lives in Chile, where anime is also huge. She grew up in Venezuela, and when I told her how many people died in my neighborhood per year, she laughed at me. That's it? People get killed in my hometown every 15 minutes. She also said, here in Chile, all we have is the Catholic Church. If you go virtual, I can come to your church. The generation of our young people is called Generation Z. The oldest members of this new generation are 25 years old. Born in 1997, when I got my college acceptance letter from Tokyo and my vision, when Pokemon made anime the biggest thing in the world. I know what matters to them most because I've worked with them for a decade. The most important thing to them, Generation Z, is authenticity. Being true to themselves. They hold everybody else, all of them, to that standard as well. You can't just expect me to just plant a church in anime culture and say, hey, look, we're hip. Bad idea. I need to make this as authentic as possible for it to work. My one professor at Wesley, Dr. Singfield, knew this. He urged me to network in Japan, find anyone who could help me visit Japan to do some research over there. I looked for people to network with and came across Pastor Hector, a Latino associate pastor at an English-speaking congregation in Tokyo called Tokyo Union Church. This past Easter weekend, I created our virtual sunrise service. I looked up from my computer to the clock one night to see it was 10.30 p.m. on the Friday before Easter. I panicked. Oops, Lord, it's Good Friday, and I didn't worship you at all today. What can I do now? The Spirit nudged me with two words. Email Hector. I told Pastor Hector in my email that I was in seminary, a youth leader and a deacon candidate. I asked for a chance to chat about my research. The next morning, I had an email from Pastor Hector telling me about job opportunities at his church. I contacted Pastor Stone, my good friend. He knew I was trying to find extra work at other churches in Virginia on top of Sudley to make ends meet. He said, you are interviewing with other churches in Virginia. It's nice that this church in Tokyo is interested in you. Go through the hiring process so you can witness your value, even though they won't hire you. You will stay in Virginia and work at two churches. One 
after another. The Virginia churches said no. Even though two of them interviewed me twice. Can you imagine what it felt like to have God close all of those doors? Can you imagine how it felt to receive and accept Tokyo Union's offer in August? My story continues to get more surreal. I know moving to Tokyo to conduct my research in anime and history would ensure the authenticity of my project. I didn't get to research Tokyo Union Church itself yet. The next slide is a picture of Tokyo Union's first trustee, G.F. Verbeck, with his child on his knee, surrounded by his students. Tokyo Union Church began as a fellowship between four missionaries. All four of them converted samurai to the church. Starting February, with the blessing of Pastor Hector, I will assemble a group called Team Anime Church at Tokyo Union. They will help me do my research directly from a church planted by the very missionaries who proclaim Christ to the samurai. From a congregation that has anime artists sitting in its pews every Sunday. The Spirit has provided me with a message, with a medium, lastly, with the most authentic home base imaginable from which to proclaim this new expression of the church. Even more surreal is that I am a continuation of your heritage suddenly. Our own Debbie Michelle did some digging into our archives in preparation for our recent anniversary and found notes from 1923. These notes showed that a century ago, Sudley donated $10 to the Red Cross to help after an earthquake and subsequent fire that destroyed Tokyo including the church building Tokyo Union was borrowing at the time. Suddenly responded as best we could during devastating events in Tokyo history. Now suddenly sends me, not only to minister to Tokyo Union as their youth director, but to start a new church for a new culture from their cultural mecca. Please keep me in your prayers as I seek to do you proud. Let us bow our heads for our prayer of dedication. Father God, we come humbly before you as your servant. Lord, make us a fruitful congregation. I will stress our positive impact beyond our brothers and sisters in the congregation. Stretch it to the end of the earth, Lord. Through us, plant the seeds of the future church. Through our gifts, Lord, translate your words in ways we cannot imagine. Ways that will make our new homes in the hearts that we touch. New homes for your spirit.
Go forth, believers, cast out demons, speak new tongues. 